Mexico, and we'll be doing the Netherlands. But before we dive in, first we have a small bit of housekeeping left over from the previous one, which was Liberia. Somehow I managed to miss probably the most interesting Liberian coin of all, this 1833 Liberia, and uh, turn this way, one cent from the American Colonization Society, founded 1816. This was a group of people, ab abolitionists, who in their objection to slavery would raise money to purchase the slaves in America and repatriate them back to the homeland of Africa. And um, they would give these repatriated slaves some number of these copper coins that they could use as money and were apparently used in Liberia back at that time as a kind of money among them. Until enough of them were there, there was actually something of their own country. And that's how the whole nation of Liberia got its start. So this is really, anyway, I don't know how that got left off in the one about Liberia. This also has the distinction of being the very first coin made in the United States of America for overseas use, specifically. So that, too, sets this apart. It's the very beginning. It's a private mint issue, not made by the U.S. Mint. But uh, it's still made in America. And like I said, it's the very first coin. So enough of that. Now let's take it. Now we get into Mexico. So the oldest dated coin is this peso. It's dated 1898, but we didn't make these, and nobody made this in 19, 1898. These were, in fact, struck in 1949, and they weren't even struck for use in Mexico, but for use in China. So, now there were pesos struck in Mexico in 1898, and the simplest and most reliable way to tell is to look at this bint mark. There's an M with a little raised O there. And uh, if it's actually made in 1898, the top of the O will be even with the top of the N. But here you can see the top of the O is much higher. In fact, about the middle of the O is even with the top of the M. So that right there. You can also tell by counting the denticles going all the way around, but that's very slow and tedious and probably not quite as reliable. The back's also pretty straightforward. Now, what was the story of these? Why are we making Mexican pesos for China? Well, we're talking 1949. The Chinese government, the national government, is struggling to keep itself afloat in the face of further and further communist uprisings and, and so forth. And um, America wants to help. But it kind of got to a point where America could only, could only do so much, and then we needed to kind of be a little more... Um, less obvious about it. So we wanted to bring in a whole bunch of Mexican pesos, which as long as they're old enough, or at least the date on them says they're old enough, were considered acceptable in China. So we made about 2 million, Mexico made about 8 million. Um, as it turned out, the 2 million we made here in San Francisco were, so far as we know, probably all destroyed. Um, if there's any exception, we, I think the only way we'd know is if it had a pedigree, like somebody at the San Francisco Mint were to keep one somewhere and say, yes, this one's from the San Francisco Mint. We have no information as far as the dyes. Presumably the dyes would have been the same. So, meaning that uh, this coin would almost certainly have been made in Mexico, but it's the closest thing we can do to have a stand-in for what was, in fact, also made in San Francisco to the tune of about 2 million strikings. So the Mexican ones, I understand, did get there. Unfortunately, it was all to no avail. China was already past recovery and, and instead went communist that year, and that was it for that. Now, we did actually begin working with Mexico for reals, however, in 1906. Now, none of these coins are made uniquely in Mexico. Um, let's start with this 50 cent. So this is a 50 cent Tavos. And apparently there may be some slight variation on the tail or shape of the dine and or the six on some of these 1906, and I'm not even sure what denominations necessarily. 
Um, you see between the 5 and the O there, and above the centavo, there's a little M. They always have the M mint mark. Uh, well, they always have an M mint mark somewhere on the coin, even though that whether they're struck in Mexico or struck in America or anywhere else. I guess that's just a matter of where the dyes come from. But anyway, some of these are in San Francisco, some in Mexico. Uh, one can never really know for sure, except maybe from very subtle dye variations. As I said, maybe something on the shape and tail of the six or nine might be some hint. Krauss list variations. Um, one or the other might be from Mexico versus America. Same story for that and or this. Again, in this case, Philadelphia Mint did make some uh, five peso coins. So cinco pesos. And there's our M. It's nice, a big letter here, 1906. And there we go, Estados Unidos Mexicanos. There we go, real Mexican gold. And uh, they struck these both in Mexico and in Philadelphia. And the same goes for this 10 pesos, 10 pesos. And again, I'm not sure if there's a clear way to delineate whether they're, the dyes are from, whether the coins are struck in Mexico or America. Something about the looks of this one just gives me this vague gut feel that this one might have in fact been struck in Mexico. But that's a gut feeling. I couldn't prove that on anything. This one looks somewhat different and might be might be one struck in Philadelphia. But again, these are subjective guesses on my part. I don't really know. Officially, there's no dye variations recognized by which they can be recognized, whether it's from the United States or from Mexico. Now, when it came to the next year, we we're done making gold coins for the Mexico, but we did make a 20 centavo. 20 centavos and a 50 centavos. And in this case, as it turns out, both of these have a die variety in that you look at the part of the seven that goes down is the top flat and then there's the seven kind of pointing down. And if you look closely, it's slightly curved. And the same goes for here. Uh, there's also a version of each of these coins where it's laser straight. And by all evidences, the laser straight ones were struck in Mexico. The slightly curved ones were struck in the United States, even though in both cases they have the M mint mark. So, these M mint marks, uh, well, again, just mean they're made from the mint in Mexico. But this one is the most unusual one in that it is unique in being the only one of these foreign coins made in the United States for foreign use that was struck at the New Orleans Mint. Pity it doesn't indicate that in any way on the coin beyond this slightly curved seven. But this was struck in New Orleans, their one and only stint at making coins for overseas use at a time when they're only going to be around a couple more years before they close down for good. But at least at the moment, they're a going concern and they were called upon to make this one coin. This one, however, was not struck in New Orleans, but some in Denver, some in San Francisco. By all evidences, the dyes sent to both are identical, and there's basically no way of discerning whether one of these was struck at Denver or at San Francisco, so it's basically just one coin for both mints. Well, after that, Mexico met up with some political instability, and for a while you had a lot of little states kind of each going their own way. And during that time, the state of Durango contracted with a private company in the United States, uh, believed to be the Denver Novelty Works. Uh, this, that's how it's reported in uh, Alston Barton, and I have no more current information on that. But as you can see, this place was contracted to make a one centavo and five centavos for Estado de Durango. So the state of Durango, one single state within Mexico that had kind of become like its own nation for the time being. And as you see, the one cent is actually made of aluminum, and the five cent is made of brass. These are you know, Republica Mexicana. As you can see, these are actually fairly nice specimens, all said and told, of these very obscure coins. Well, as we get back into the, into the 1930s, uh, Mexico again seems to be returning to some measure of political stability. And once again, the United States is enlisted to help them make their 50 centavos. And now all three U.S. mints plus the Mexican mint are making these. Uh, if you grabbed one of these at random, the odds are probably about five out of six they'd be from the U.S. But 
I don't know if there's any clear dye variety that will tell you whether one of these is made in Mexico or in America, and probably nothing for the various mints of America. So this one, again, my subjective guess is I have a funny feeling just from the look of it that it might have been made in in Mexico, but I could be wrong on this. There's no clear dye variations I can point at to say, yeah, this is the Mexican or this is the American version, if indeed there is a dye variety at all. Now, that's all that's reported in Alson Barton from Mexico. However, after the time of Alson Barton, there was yet one more, and that was we didn't make coins, but we did uh, make coin blanks, planchets, at our mint. So the Denver Mint made a whole bunch of these things here for these 50 centavos, and then Mexico struck them into coins like you see here. And they made a bigger one for the Mexican peso at that time. Both of these are just copper nickel coins, no more silver. So uh, these Denver, these, these are both blanks made from the, at the Denver Mint and then turned into coins in Mexico. So that finishes out Mexico. Now let's move over to the Netherlands. Now the Netherlands had a, uh, we made some coins for the homeland. Unfortunately, there's a lot of tough stories about this, and some of these are either rare, and one is so rare I don't even have it here. But let's start with what we do have. We started making coins with the Netherlands Homeland in 1943 with this five cent, with this ten cent here. Try to see through that toning, and this twenty-five cent. Uh, look at that. Not even all that great of a condition of a coin. Now, it's not always easy to tell the difference between these, and actually maybe it'll be easier to see on the 25 cent. So the fronts are obviously the same, I mean, you know, ignore the wear and tear difference, and the backs have one crucial distance difference. Under the three, you see the P, meaning both of these are, you know, tilted, meaning that these are minted in Philadelphia, but under the one, one over here is this thing that looks kind of like a odd looking tea or something that's supposed to be a palm tree not a very good palm tree but it is a palm tree over here under the one is what's obviously meant to be an acorn complete with a little stem sticking out of the top you can actually see it get a pretty good look at what, what we're looking for there and uh, we have the same distinction existing between the uh, homeland 10 cent and the overseas 10 cent made for the same year again. Under the three, oh wow, this is hard to see. You can kind of make out the P, just as you can see there's a P there. And under the one, there's an acorn. You know, it almost looks more like a toadstool. It's really hard to see the stem coming out the top. Whereas here, again, you've got that sort of asymmetrical sort of tea, palm tree sort of thing for the colony. Colonies of Curacao and Suriname. Curacao and Suriname. So that's the only way you know that this is the homeland. So, but most of these were listed in the same category. They were made in the same um, mintage year, the 1943s and 1944s. So, there's no, there's no way to know for sure how many of them were dated 1943 and how many were dated 1944, only that the 1943 seem to be very difficult to come by, where the 1944s are relatively common. The 1944P in particular is a very common coin, and now once again, if you look carefully, you can see the acorn looks certainly more like an acorn than a palm tree and there's p somewhat harder to find but not a big deal they just don't come up is the 1944s the front is always the same and again there the acorn didn't form too well it's almost more like a newborn toadstool or something but it is supposed to be an acorn and now you see an s instead of a p under that four so this is made in San Francisco. Uh, the 25 cent was made only in Philadelphia, however. There it is again. 
And you see the P, and there the acorn looks beautifully just like an acorn. Again, 44 P's are fairly easy to find. Then there is the one gilder, also made in 1944. And um, now, if you look at the uh, way the, the words wrap around, it all ends Netherlanden, not quite under the neck as distinct from the smaller coins where you can see the final N and part of the E is totally under the neck. Apparently there is a variety of this 1944 Gilder where it comes around. In fact, on that variety it'll look the same way as it does on this one where you can see it actually does go underneath. But we'll get to that in a moment. I don't have that variety of 1944 Gilder, but I do, at least there's the Gilder. Now, 1945 is kind of the strangest year of all. Um, well, there was also a Denver mint 10 cent. So there was P, D, uh, there was P and Denver and S. The Denver, almost all of them were destroyed. Um, like the barest handful escape, and when they turn up at all, they're literally maybe you know many thousands of dollars. They're really rare and expensive. And it's not too far behind that is the, the 1945s. Now here is, in fact, a 1945 um, 10 cent. And again, you look and see the acorn and the P, 1945. And then, well, San Francisco is no longer involved with this. And, and apparently nor is Denver. Although Denver supposedly struck a few in 1945, it's only about 8 million as opposed to a whole lot more. Either none of those were, have survived or they might have just been dated 1944. Kraus does not list a 1945D Netherland 10 cent at all, for the home country, that is. Uh, they do have for some colonies, but not for the home country. However, um, it does list the 1944 D 10 cent, but as something extremely rare. So now here's the 25 cent. It's probably the commonest of these 1945s. There's our acorn and our P, and you can see 25 cents. It's probably the commonest of these, but commonest here is relative. Even these are in the many hundreds of dollars just to get even a lower grade specimen. And then here's our 1945 uh, Gilder. So there it is, 1945. And again, ignoring the little sp carbon spot or whatever that is, that's plainly an acorn with a very clear stem on it. And the P to indicate this is made in Philadelphia. So but what happened was, we had made these coins in 1945 and the Denver Mint 1944 for the Netherlands. And then the Netherlands got, in, you know, got involved with this thing called the Lend-Lease Act, which basically mean they were going to pay us in silver for something we're doing to help rebuild their country. And as a result, what ended up happening is a lot of these coins that we had just struck for them just turned right around and got given back to us as silver to pay for this whole Lend-Lease Act. And so all but the barest handful of all of these things, all, all of these 1945s plus the 44D, only the barest handful of any of those escaped. So this would be, a, you know, thousands of dollars. This, so would this be, and this is, you know, at least high hundreds or into the thousands as they get to the better grades. So these are 1945s are pretty rare. Anyway, except for the 1944D 10 cent, this represents, and the die variety for the, 1944 Gilder, that would represent the sum total of what the United States Mint made for the Netherlands.